So we got a iPad Mini 4 with a Best Buy right now. It's yeah. awesome. Can't play with it yet. We got our demo one right now. There's nothing new. It's the Air 2. Smaller. Same device. We should get iPad Pros in like this Friday. They're not out yet. I doubt you'll have iPad Pros in. We should get our, just our demo one in. Apple, the Apple Store doesn't have a demo. That's what our Apple rep told us at least. He like we won't be able to put it out for a while yet, but I think it's I think it's made out. Uh, all right, so uh, so we talked about kernel mode and stuff like that last time. We were talking about process management, um, the importance of memory management. We started talking about uh, storage stuff a little bit, talking about how uh, we were dealing with kind of the generic idea of a driver, right? Generic idea of a driver is to uh, um, create an abstract layer that sits between actual hardware and you know the the things that need to use it so when we think about this idea of a um, a file system well things that have file systems are like hard drives and usb sticks and and tape drives all these things have file systems in it and all file systems are built around this idea that they store this animal called a file and a file is from our perspective as computer scientists is a data structure okay simple data structure just holds you know five or six different pieces of information about what that file is, but an important data structure nonetheless. Um, but an interesting thing from a problem-solving perspective uh, with, within operating systems is as long as that file data structure remains constant, as long as we don't change that, we are stuck with work with solving problems in terms of the existing file data structure. Make sense? So it does end up being a limiting, potentially, potentially limiting factor on um, evolving operating systems. You know, if you're, uh, <coughs> and we've seen models like this before in computing. For instance, for a long time, anytime you wanted to have any sort of um, kind of dynamic multimedia content on a website, you would use Flash. That was the go-to move for dynamic multimedia content. Well, now Flash is no longer in vogue. It's it's uh, um, kind of the, it's, if you're using Flash, you're doing it wrong, is the, is the way it works today. You know, the only places that really have Flash are legacy sites that have had Flash for the last decade and just haven't updated yet. Everybody else has moved to HTML5. <coughs> but in order for us to have that transition, it took advocates like Apple and, and some other companies who said, we're not going to support Flash on our mobile devices, right? So it caused that move. Now... Obviously, we can look at Flash and say it was an old technology that needed to die. You know, let's just say bad on battery life certainly has features in it that could be replaced with newer, modern ways of doing things. Uh, so to, to that end, it made sense. You know, but at some point, are we going to get to the, the, the place where we say, well, you know what, maybe a file... Uh, isn't good enough anymore. Maybe we should actually perceive us storing things differently. Something like that. Um, and it's, it becomes very interesting because when we start thinking about our uh, uh, future file systems and, and uh, you know, a file system needs to manage what's on a hard drive. Let's just use that as our initial example, right? Okay, well, well uh, what, as a user, what do we look for in a hard drive? What's important to you about a hard drive? Okay, speed and put a lot of crap on it, right? Speed and put a lot of crap on it. And last thing, even though it's pretty, you know, is probably the interface, how it's going to hook into your computer. But for the most part, they're all generic now, right? USB or internal eSATA or SATA. Um, so the punchline is, is from our perspective, you want it to be fast enough and hold a whole bunch of crap. That's the resource that is our hard drive. The resource that is our memory is be fast and be big enough to do everything we want to do. Hard drive, we care about its fastness less so. You know, some of us, any of you who are uh, maybe built gaming machines have a solid state drive as your boot drive and then a large who cares how fast this is drive for everything else. Okay, what's the rationale for that? Why, why, why have that giant mechanical drive in there um, that to store your applications on it and stuff like that, but have your operating system on the fast drive. Because I have a thousand gigs of games, and my SSD was is like two hundred fifty six gigabytes. Okay. Which is really bad. Buying more 
much less of SSD and just a Linux hub. Okay. So, so certainly there's a wallet limitation, okay? But would you have benefited at all? What benefit would you have had if you were able to afford a large enough SSD for to hold all your games? Less load times, faster access to the so. Just for getting the game initially into memory, right? Typically, video games load large percentages of, of themselves into RAM. So during game time, you're not having to do that swapping problem we talked about before. Uh, typically, we're not multitasking video games. So typically, you wouldn't have like Battlefield running on a, in a window on half your screen while you're writing a term paper. Um, you know, so like like ag aggressive games like that. You know, you might have Angry Birds running in the other side of the window. That kind of those kind of mindless games, but the, you know, those are obviously going to be significantly less resource intensive and and, and that type of stuff. But um, Certainly, that load time, the amount of time it takes for the stuff to come off the hard drive and go into system RAM is faster when you have a machine that can, when you have a hard drive that can read and write more quickly, right? So that takes less time. But the trade off is I can spend more money and get half of the capacity, or I can spend, uh, you know, let's, let's say you can spend twice the money and get half the capacity. Or you can spend half the money and get twice the capacity. So you can decide what's most important. So a lot of folks end up doing um, their operating system on the solid state drive because your operating system is constantly being having aspects of it loaded in and loaded out of memory and things like that. So having that not be a uh, bottleneck in the performance of your computer is beneficial. Plus your machine will boot faster, but let's call it marginally, marginally faster. Um, but that's kind of the cool kid thing to do now, right? Have a small solid state drive that has the stuff that you use very, very often that'll fit on there. Um, and a lot of folks, what they'll do is when they have a, kind of their game in the month that they're playing, they'll just put that game on that hard drive. So any movement in and out of memory is fast on that particular hard drive. But at the end of the day, it all has to do with that bus that we talked about in here. The speed at which stuff can leave one device, one resource, and enter into another resource. And in this case, it's that all-important memory resource for us. Okay? Um, but, getting back to what I was saying before, is there a problem with our file data structure? At some point, we need to hit a wall where our hard drives aren't going to get any bigger. At this point, the wall has more to do with uh, mechanical failure and, you know, the physical size of the device, right? We have this idea of a three and a half inch hard drive, right? The three, three and a half inch hard drive has not just a, a, a width uh, a kind of standard, it also has the height standard. It won't fit in the slots it was designated for if they make it too big. So now we're stuck where we can only fit so much crap inside something that's, you know, that tall, all right? Um, no, oh, you want a 5,000 terabyte drive? No problem. You know, this looks like one of the later Harry Potter books, but you know, <laughs> here, you, here you go. <laughs> There's your gigantic hard drive. Um, now, what we are going to start seeing, likely, um, as we have a bigger and bigger need for storage, is you might see some custom type storage devices, custom hard, dri hard, hard drives that are meant to be external only, come with their own housing. Uh, that don't rely on that standard size. So we might see a move away from standard and then a move back towards a new standard. Okay, we need to get outside of that comfort zone because right now we're starting to hit a physical limitation of we can't put more platters on the hard drives to make them bigger without, again, too much heat, higher rate of failure, all these other things, right? Power requirements. Um, the external ones, some of them need to be plugged in. So uh, the, that's the difference that there is is whether or not it is a uh, two and a half inch drive or a um, three and a half inch drive. The three and a half inch drives all require external power. The the USB port does, doesn't provide enough. Okay. Where the two and a half inch ones that are made for laptops, uh, those have a lower power requirement, and USB has enough to to power it. Um, usually, those are also slower hard drives, but not because they're innately slower, but because you probably are they making external solid state yet? It's kind of a external solid state, unless it's eSATA, it kind of doesn't make sense. 
It's like we're gonna put a really, really, really fast hard drive, and then we're gonna we're gonna hook up one of those the tin cans with a string between it <laughs> to your computer. That's USB, by the way. <laughs> that's, uh, that's gonna be your speed. So, um, but certainly eSATA could make sense for a uh, uh, external uh, solid state. Yep. How do you run three and a half inch drive in your in your docks? Then Oh, it's hooked up to your power supply of your computer. So it's as if it's got, yeah, I mean, when you buy, when you build a computer, you get, like, you know, you know what's the, you know, are they probably the common size now for a gaming machine? It's like a kilowatt power supply. Is that about right? Sure. 500 watts, 750 kilowatt. 750 sounds right. I mean, I'm surprised, actually. I mean, I would say two or three years ago, the cool kids did the, the, the one kilowatt. just sounds cooler, right? Something like that. But, you know. That guy is able to power a whole bunch of devices, you know, so you have a bunch of cables in there that plug into it. So it is getting its external. You didn't miss a quiz, but I did get your email. So I would have excused you anyways. Actually, I only, was it a reasonable excuse? I didn't even look. I just saw you email me. Just assumed it must have been a reasonable excuse. Anybody who collects tears gets a free pass. All right. Oh, did you guys see my artwork on uh, Facebook? My wife took me to a painting class last night. So I made a, a, a painting of, uh, there was a, an artist up there who was teaching us how to draw trees and, and crap. So I, I drew a, uh, a ferret that's juggling fire. <laughs> and mine has a skeleton. It was very abstract art. I had some trees too, but see, they, they, they screwed up because they tell you, they, they're telling you how to measure like the distance between your trees, like, like put four fingers there. Well, my wife's four fingers <laughs> is like the width of one of my fingers. This is my wife. I have a pocket wife. I don't have to buy a second plane ticket. I can just put her in my overhead until takeoff. Um, um, but yeah, so I couldn't fit all the trees on my because she said four fingers, so I only you know, we're supposed to have six trees. I only got four trees, and then the width of the trees is supposed to be two fingers. Oh, that worked out well. Had a bigger That's right. So I had monster trees with a fire juggling ferret. You should check it out on Facebook. It was epic. What's up? Okay, so with all this storage stuff, I mean, I've got solid state and then a larger drive. Could you just add three or four three terabyte storage drives and be okay on a regular computer? Like, you really have to store that much. Okay, so reasonable question. So now you've added. So now let's say you have uh, let's say you have three two terabyte drives. Right. Okay, and you're going to run these as separate drives. Mm -hmm. So now you're going to decide. Okay, well, what am I going to put on one drive? What am I going to put on another drive? You have to manage that yourself, your own organization. Right. Now you could set it up as a RAID. Uh, where you're going to allow either hardware or software RAID to determine what drive something goes on. Um, you know, if you do a concatenation RAID to give yourself six, that's RAID one, to give your, well, no, it's RAID zero, to get yourself uh, six gigabytes, six terabytes of, uh, of space, um, you are now at the mercy of how it decides it should put that stuff on the different drives. And now you have three resources that, that uh, RAID controller is having to manage. Three different read write heads. Um, so, I mean, the problem does get more complex. So you can say, well, why not have three different drives? Will three different drives be better than one drive? In some ways, yes. In other ways, no. And there will be additional overhead. So three drives certainly won't give you three times the performance if you're writing three things at once. <coughs> it might get you twice the performance writing three things at once, um, assuming your RAID controller intelligently figures out to write two separate drives, right? Um, so you're kind of at the mercy of that, but it's not always as clean cut as we might like. Um, so there's actually a, you know, a, a whole bunch of science and like uh, there's a technology called SAN, storage area networks. Um, and most of, in fact, in a lot of uh, uh, computer science, modern technology, where we're writing code, where we're doing things is in those interfaces. How do we transition stuff from this device to this device more better? More bestest, more bestest. See, I haven't said that in a while, have I? No. 
can get back and get that back. All right, does that kind of make sense? So, you know, the, that's the trick that we're doing. We're not making that many changes on our drivers because our drivers have to stay generic. Our devices are going to keep getting cooler. We don't, we don't want to have a limitation on our graphic card makers so they can't make newer, cooler, more expensive graphics cards that we have to you know, take out a student loan for, right? You know, we like drooling over them. We, we want to have the, we want to have the, the, the cool things. Um, so the science has to be in the middle. How do we take this generic coupler, the generic driver, and hook it to this thing that was invented uh, in a, you know, 15 hours in the future, <laughs> you know, and uh, how do we make those guys work together so that we can squeeze the top performance out of this? So that's kind of one of our sciences uh, is, is uh, that transition. Um, but the important thing to kind of think about here is that the, uh, we are working within various limitations. So we don't just have this uh, um, ability to just haphazardly create a 300 terabyte drive even though we have the tech we have the technology to create a 300 terabyte drive it's not a standard so we were playing up against those uh those rules yeah could you um create like a custom housing in a space that would be able to support something like this oh sure you absolutely could but the companies who are making these things internally they're going to have their uh, research and development divisions that are are doing these things but externally, they're also a business. So, you know, are they going to spend a whole lot of time and money building something they can sell to three clients? Or are they going to spend less time and money building something they can send, sell to 300 million clients? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's business, but that's another, I mean, that is in conflict with, with uh, innovation, right? Um, so it's, uh, which then becomes very interesting, uh, you know, something I have seen recently, historically people would maybe have this comment that Apple is the innovation leader, right? Um, I think I've lost a bunch of respect for them recently with all this focus on watch bands and, and, and stuff like that, where it's, um, it's no longer about technology. Now it's more, they're almost like a clothing, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, uh. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And I still like their, their products, but let's focus on the product and the technology, not the, you know, the, what, what's the, don't they, aren't the new bands like leather bands and stuff like that? I don't even think with the Apple watch, I don't think a band should exist. That isn't the sport band personally. I don't think a watch should exist. That isn't the, the cheap sport watch. It's a computer. We're going to replace it in a year. Get the cheapest one you can. Okay, They have the same internals. You know, Do you want to have a gold watch a year from now that can't run the latest OS? <laughs> it's like, well, I have a $10,000 watch, but the thing barely functions. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's useless. Now they're making a car. Yeah. So, I mean, those types of things, I like that stuff. I like the innovation side of things. As long as Apple doesn't get into the business of being, yeah, I mean, they're doing the, they're competing with Google, the oh, self-driving so, cars. So did Apple, like, pair up with Tesla for that? Or? I, there's all these rumors. I, Apple hasn't officially said they're doing cars, but there seems to be all sorts of evidence, whatever. So I'm all for that. I'm all for this whole self-driving car innovation stuff. I mean, that's, that's really cool that we have big companies focusing on that problem. And even related to what we're talking about here, what's the problem? Right now, it seems like the limiting factor is the people who aren't in self-driving cars. Most of these accidents that are occurring with self-driving cars deal with the unpredictability of human beings. Where every, if we all had all self-driving cars, we could just flip the switch and say we're all in self-driving cars. We probably have zero accidents or very few accidents really quick. But the fact that we are having a hybrid model, we have real people, real minds making decisions. I'm late for work. I need to be a little bit more aggressive. That light was still yellow, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, th those types of things. I missed the a, a, a computer, uh, you know, uh, it, it can't predict for that stuff. So it, we like having these big companies working on those hard problems. Um, so I totally like the fact Apple's doing that. What I don't want Apple to do is try to compete with Ford. 
You know, I don't think we need to have an Apple car unless it's doing something very, very, very special towards innovation, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, whatever, right? But then you know, I think we're fine. I mean, with our car, man, I mean, this is how it should work. We don't want to put our car manufacturers out of business. They're good at what they do. So I think we want to think about having systems from either Google or Apple that ought, that need to be compatible with each other. You don't want to have accidents accidents because of an incompatibility. <laughs> Sorry, your car runs <laughs> you know, Android. Runs we, we had an, an OS incompatibility. They upgraded to uh, Car OS four, and um, there was a bug in the latest uh, you know Android Drive. <laughs> that that seems to be probably what the names of the OSs would be, right? Yeah. Car OS and Android Drive because it's an Android Wear for yeah, the, the watches um, you know the, there's just the incompatibility in the communication protocol somebody dropped a curly brace on the JSON and oh my gosh it's all hell broke loose <laughs> um, there was children being yeah but the punchline is is that that's where those companies belong from an innovation perspective right um, you know and, and they need to be make sure their software is compatible with each other we don't need to take Samsung out of the business of making memory and hard drives Okay, we need to make better software to work with those equipment. We don't need to take Ford and Honda and Hyundai and you know, all the Toyota. We don't need to take these car manufacturers out of building cars. That's what they're good at. We need to make better software on them that keeps people from getting killed. Right? Let's reduce the number of death, deaths on the interstate and stuff like that. That's where technology innovation needs to be. Um, so we'll see if Apple starts designing, you know, well, you can get the latest Apple car with the, I don't know, the, the I don't know, German endangered bear skin, uh, you know, seats or something. It's we took a few points from Volkswagen on this one, so it's really efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody that watches the news? It doesn't even have a steering wheel. Everything's swipe. So <laughs> Want to turn left? That's a gesture. Oh, the wrong gesture. <laughs> wrong, wrong gesture. Whatever you do, don't pinch and squeeze. That's yes, right. So, um. Yeah, so I don't know. I've, I've, historically, I've really liked I've really liked Apple from an innovation perspective, but I don't feel I feel like they're trying to play innovator today. They're not actually innovating. You, you kind of know what I'm saying. That's how you sell stuff, right? Yeah, but I don't want them to just sell stuff. You know, so you know, it's the uh, I want them to make good stuff so that the other guys have to make good stuff. I mean, we live in a really awesome world techno technologically having these two cool companies like Google and Apple who keep trying to one up each other. You know, but it's almost it almost feels to me like right now Apple's not playing the same game. I mean, Google still is trying to do their innovation thing and Google, you know, historically what does Google do? They get into they put money into a thousand different projects. 997 of them are complete flops, but three of them turn into something cool. We like that. We, we appreciate the fact that we have a really rich company that is willing to put resources towards innovation. Apple has historically done that as well, but with watch bands, come on. I mean, let's leave that to the designer person who makes clothing and stuff. I mean, we, we have a world of, I mean, I'm not a fashionista person, obviously, but I assume we have a world of very talented designers whose job it is to do that. <laughs> I don't need Apple making that kind of crap. <laughs> we want Apple making technology. On the latest leather bands, they just paired with a designer on it. They didn't make them. So why doesn't the designer just release the bands and say Apple Watch compatible? Instead of Apple having, instead of Apple spending 20 minutes of a keynote talking about watch bands. Because on the designer side, that gives them, you know, it's just like why... Apple Fine, they can advertise on their site. Don't spend 20 minutes on your keynote introducing oh, new technology yeah. on watch bands. All right. All so in any case, we see we see examples of this stuff all over the place where we have, uh, um, you know, we have certain limitations, certain, you know, the, the almost like the matrix. We have to play within the rules of the world that we're, we're given, and that becomes a limitation. Uh, and then we have to make decisions as technologists as to, when do we go outside of the standard because we think it's time to make that next move? Or when do we have to play within that standard so that we make everybody else happy? And then we have the, the human component of this thing, you know, that usually comes down to money. This is what you were asking about, is this idea of like, okay, well, do I really do the cool thing or do the thing that's going to make me the most money? And 
too often probably it's the makes the most money is the, the the issue. Otherwise, we probably have teleportation by now. We don't. I'm sure it's the uh, the uh, the airlines, the air the the, uh, the airline uh, uh, folks are keeping teleportation under the under wraps. See, I would, you know, I've actually spent quite a bit of time thinking about what it would take to make teleportation, from more from a computer science perspective, like treating our atoms as bits. You know, let's, I mean, I don't want to get too much into, I don't know enough about biology to reassemble a human body and hope it's the same, right? <laughs> you know, and then we have, you know, from a Christian perspective, it, 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 can the soul break into that? <laughs> is, that is that a, is that a, <laughs> that's a point. That's a point. Okay. So, so I'm not going to even go into that world, but just from a, a sheer physical perspective, you know, if we treat atoms as bits, how do you blow those bits apart and put them back together? And I, what, is it, can I go through a tube somewhere? We transfer you through them. I don't know. Fascinating. Do you think it'd be possible for any storage system to contain the amount of information that's in the body? Um. Isn't there some? I think there is a statistic on how much the human brain like in terms of. Well, how much the human brain can store, but he's asking like if we if we literally take the number of atoms that are in a human body, uh, and then we turn an atom into a data structure. So let's we'll be tech, we'll be tech, technical about this. Okay, so we have to think about what are all the pieces of information we need to store regarding an individual atom, kind of. You know, if we think about the human body as a 3D grid, like a puzzle, you know, in 3D space, where does this uh, atom go, right? So you at least have to keep track of some, some information about each atom. It's just not going to be one bit. So the atom has a payload. It's, it's a physical thing, right? Um, and uh, then we have the, uh, the issue of the information we need to keep track of it. Uh, then we have the unknown because we have these, you know, these these large hadron colliders and stuff like that that keep smashing atoms together to get to our smaller subparticles, right? And I think we're at least those smart people are at least pretty confident that we haven't found all of those. There's other subparticles of subparticles of subparticles, and so at some point we're we're having data loss. <laughs> and and I, I feel confident in saying that if we're dealing with transportation. Teleportation specifically, data loss is relatively unacceptable. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. See, it was a good tech joke. UDP, UDP is an acceptable packet loss, right? You know, we use UDP for transmitting video and stuff like that. Yeah, I drop one frame. What's the big deal? <laughs> Don't want to use UDP to transfer atoms. <laughs> It's like, look, most of the atoms showed up. You know, the guy looks like a Picasso at the end. <laughs> so, uh, but your point is, do we have, uh, um, you know, something that can that can uh, store everything about an atom? I don't think it's we're even capable of answering that because, at the very least, I feel that atoms have a lot more to them than we suspect. So that means that. The amount of stuff we need to store given one atom is probably exponentially larger than we might expect it to be. So if I were guessing, then I'd probably agree with you. We probably don't have the space, but we also don't have the technology to break it down to its individual components. I tell you, those large Hadron Collider things are just fascinating to me. I mean, you know, it's, it's like Neanderthal science, right? You know, boys and their toys. So, like, you know, what's the best way to look at what's in an atom? Well, we're going to speed it up real fast. We're going to smash them into each other. It's our equivalent of just, like, throwing rocks on the ground and watching them break apart. Except atoms are so tiny that we really just need to put them in a collision course with each other and then take a whole bunch of cameras and try to see what's happening when they smash into each other. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> it's like the ultimate, I don't know, the ultimate video game or something like that. Smashing subatomic particles against each other at you know ninety nine percent the speed of light and watching what happens, what it blows up out of them. <laughs> it's a little more boring when you actually you know it's like in the course of one thirty thousandth of a second that that occurs. I know, but that's why the cameras are so awesome. Like, look what we can see. 
And these colliders are, uh, you know, like like over, like underneath, like whole cities and stuff like that to give enough room to ramp up to to, to ramming speed, right? It's just awesome. Gotta have a lot of room. To and then with the with the uh, large hadron collider, like what four or five years ago, what didn't wasn't there like a bug in something where they thought they may have opened up like a billion microscopic black holes or something like that that were gonna suck the universe in? Man, imagine waking up and worrying about the bug in your software doing that. <laughs> yeah, you got the one dude who's bumping into a couple of cars in a parking lot. You got another dude who's opening up black holes that are sucking up the planet. <laughs> and then you have the guy who's not putting together people right in the transporter. <laughs> That's what we're going to do. That's your future. You're going to be those people. They're going to go out and ruin lives. <laughs> Tear apart families. Destroy universes. <laughs> I'll take the last one. Sorry. Yeah, then you had the, the, the theoretical physicists talking about how the black holes are, are so m minuscule that we couldn't see them. So now you're wondering, like, well, maybe they're here and we don't even know it. They're sucking away reality one, you know, one micron at a time. And eventually we're going to start seeing, like, tears in the fabric of space. You can't see black holes anyway. It's gonna be awesome. What's this? I can't see black holes anywhere. Well, but you can you can detect their existence by uh, looking at the edges where lights disappearing and stuff like that. <coughs> All right. Um, same crap we talked about. Same crap we talked about. Um, we've already kind of talked about this moving stuff from disk to main memory into cache back to the hardware. You know, to the hardware registers that hold transaction that. Something leaves a hard drive, gets into memory, ultimately gets number crunched by the CPU. There's this life cycle that's happening in our operating systems that have all these managers and you know there to help us help us do it. Um, the I/O subsystem we we talked at the high level about interrupts and things moving off the CPU, um, protection and security out the window. We don't like that. Microsoft Vista. We'd rather be we'd rather it be convenient or a computer crash half the time than be inconvenienced because you think we have a virus every three seconds. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I mean security stuff obviously important, but it's that balance between keeping us secure and still letting us do what we want to do. Um, distributed computing is, is a really interesting uh, uh, science and we actually near the end of the course we talk about kind of a theoretical distributed operating system and why they don't necessarily, why they haven't worked and will they ever work type thing from a kind of a theoretical perspective but the idea would be is what if all of our computers played a role in the world operating system, let's say. So everybody's hard drive, everybody's memory was all part of this shared resource that, you know, these these giant memory managers and uh, file system managers kind of worked with. Thinking about the, the connection pieces, that the bus that exists in our micro computer here, right? You know, now we have that on the global scale. Like if you're moving stuff out of a system, if you're moving stuff from my hard drive, or, you know, probably from his, if I have an application that actually lives on his hard drive, not, he doesn't know it, I don't know, it's just it lives in the global storage, and I need to move it into the memory of some dude in Moscow, uh, there is delay, right, by today's technology, but at what point is there not delay? Uh, at what point is it fast enough to do that, and does that work? Um, from that perspective, so distributing computing for, distributed computing for a general application operating system Seems to be there's problems with it. We'll go into a lot more detail. So how does that play into the internet? Well, internet becomes a bottleneck. You know, our our internet is really really good what it gives us access to, but it wouldn't be a, a, what would be called a high. You wouldn't want to have your hard drive connected to your computer via cable modem. Even though we you know we, oh you have a hundred megabit per second uh, internet great. Well, that's only download, so we can move it from we can we can install stuff to our hard drive at a, up to 100 megabit per second, but you can only upload it to memory where it needs to be fast. Our load times, as you point out, at uh, yeah, let's let's call it five megabit per second. <laughs> it's like it's been 45 minutes and uh, Angry Birds isn't unloading. <laughs> 
Um, so uh, there's all sorts of limitations there. But distributed computing in general is a very practical and heavily used thing. And it's, it's big related to security, where uh, most security algorithms deal with this idea of, uh, um, you know, how the, the level of security the algorithm has is relative to how long it would take a mod modern technology to crack it. You know, to, to you know, crack a password, let's say something like that. Well, one computer, maybe it would take uh, uh, the computer 10 lifetimes to crack a password. But if we get a million computers all working on the same problem at the same time, that goes way down, <laughs> right? To the point where you can now crack things in seconds. Um, you know, and a famous thing, this happened when I was, uh, um, this was probably uh, 20 years ago or something like that. Uh, there was a, it's a website, it probably still exists, called distributed.net, uh, that does, um, it, it kind of stress tests, or at least it used to stress test uh, encryption algorithms. And there was a, um, a kind of a famous uh, encryption algorithm the government made called DES, D-E-S. And they just announced this new one called Triple DES that they basically said was like uncrackable. Okay, the government, you know, the government like did all sorts of, uh, this is back when they used to actually talk about the things they were working on. Okay? You know, so they were like, oh, yeah, this thing is unbreakable. We, we tested it on the Martians. It works fine. Um, all sorts of things like that. Well, distributed, when it was released, distributed.net did a, a, a test on it, to stress test it. How long do you think it took them to crack it? It's like 17 seconds. Wow. <laughs> it was like... It was like <laughs> It was it was so embarrassing. It was awesome. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> just got, the thing just got destroyed. <laughs> so, interesting applications for distributed computing type stuff where we offload work that could be easily, easily divide, divided up into a whole bunch of different machines. All right. Speaking of algorithms, did you see uh, Huey, I mean Google, released a new compression algorithm? Yeah, it's open source. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Um, let's see, um, special purpose systems, we can just assume what that probably means, you know, tiny little operating systems for special things, like the operating system that runs your toaster and crap like that. Um, you know, this concept of computing environments obviously has changed just even during our lifetimes, right? You know, what we call a computer today is very different to the initial idea of a computer. Um, da -da -da. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer computing, this is stuff that we use all the time today with like BitTorrents and, and, and things like that where we're um, spreading the, the, the wealth of how data is moved. And the reason we're doing that is exactly the stuff we're talking about in here where we have to manage these highways that are connecting our various resources to each other and they can only move data so quickly. So by having more people sharing the same data, we can get the data to more people more quickly. Make sense? Um, let's see. And that chapter was what it was talking about, like master and slaves, right? Um, well, master and slaves would be relative to probably file storage stuff. <coughs> would be my guess. The, um, you know, historically IDE hard drives were set up as master slave type things where you had to manage kind of two interstates as data was flowing to one hard drive versus the other. I mean, it's possible they related it to this, but that would be the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, web-based computing, whatever, um, you know, open source in general, um, uh, I'm a little bit, uh, our initial gut feeling as it relates to open source would be open source is good. You know, when somebody says, oh, we've open sourced X, Y, Z, in general, technologists who kind of know what that might mean, that the initial impression we have is, oh, that's a positive thing, right? Um, how might open sourcing stuff actually be a negative thing? Put it out there. People can find the, the flaws in it. Okay. Security holes. So certainly you, uh, so a benefit of that is uh, more people are, are able to see your code and see where there's flaws. And if those people use it constructively to help make the product better, that's great. More often than not, people are using that destructively to write viruses and that kind of stuff. So would we have as many viruses if the source code wasn't directly made available? I suspect not. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it does mean there are negative, uh, negative side effects. Um, similarly, 
the idea of open source is to promote innovation in general, right? So we if they take a product that you that, that people like, and now you say we're going to invite the entire community, the computing community, to come and contribute to this project. Well, that's great. The issue is is that uh, you get all sorts of different skill levels contributing to this thing, and it's sometimes you spend more time separating the wheat from the chaff than you do actually improving the product. On the other side, what you also do is you, um, I think you have, we have this idea that lots and lots and lots of people are going to contribute to any open source project, when the reality is, is a very tiny, small percentage of developers actually do that. So you're almost just kind of chicken or the egg type problem. You're almost doing something that you think is a positive thing that has some of these negative side effects, but not getting real strong positive performance out of it because the people that you expected to help contribute really aren't there, really aren't doing it. In general, I would say that open source, in my opinion, is, is in some ways bad. Um, you know, even though when we hear the word proprietary, it leaves a bad connotation, right? Open source, good connotation, proprietary, bad connotation. I think it's more complex than that at the, at the end of the day. Um, but that's like literally a 10-hour debate or something like that at some point. Um, all right, so let's jump into Chapter 2 here. Do, do, do. And we're done. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to be talking about some more specifics in what we've been talking about. I'm actually going to try to go through Chapter 2 relatively quickly as well. Um, so we're going to go one layer deeper into some of the things we've been talking about, and then we're going to start talking about specific... We actually start talking about specifics in here as well, but just kind of uh, dive in here. Um, when we talk about interfacing with our computers, most of us today think about using our... Uh, um, you know, mouse and keyboard and graphical user interface, and we view kind of the DOS-based command line interface, which usually CLI is the thing, as being old, weaker, things like that, right? Um, realistically, there are things that we can do that are far more powerful on um, uh, the from the command line interface than you can in a, in a, in a GUI. Uh, and let me give you kind of an example uh, that just happened over this past weekend. My my dad was trying to, so this is more of an IT type thing uh, and, and a use for programming in IT. Uh, my dad was trying to empty his um, downloads folder on his Mac to his uh, uh, trash. And he missed and ended up putting it all on his desktop. Now, my dad is one of those people that already keeps everything on his desktop. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of files. Okay. And he's also one of those people that downloads, you know, atta you know, attachments from all these emails that he's read and probably hasn't emptied his downloads folder in, let's call it five years. Oh my God. So we can imagine thousands of files were dumped onto his desktop. So now it's a matter of separating the wheat from the chaff. We want to get these files ultimately in the trash, but let's get them back into the downloads folder, separating what is now in the downloads folder to what is uh, in the uh, what is supposed to be on the desktop. Okay, now we have an issue. Uh, this gets back to the file data structure and file systems in general. Most what are called POSIX or most non-POSIX file systems, which we'll talk about uh, later. Just it's a standard. POSIX is a standard. Do not keep track of the birth date of a file. They keep track of the last modified date of the file. All right. It just so happens that Apple, uh, their OS, being a POSIX operating system, does actually keep track of the birth date in the file data structure. 
uh, which means that you can find out when that particular instance of that file was birthed in its current state, in its current place. But that piece of information is very difficult to get at. So if we kind of look at this real quick, oh, it's not console, it's terminal. Uh, let's just do, so let's just do a stat star on this. So here's a command line thing and we have all of these files, all these pieces of information that are in here and one of these guys gives the birth date. So one of these pieces of information gives the birth date. So now we need to somehow parse this information. So I kind of figured out that the, the birth date of this thing was about 9.52 a.m. Um, so anywhere between 9.50 and 9.54, since there were so many files, let's say, a.m. on that morning. It was Any file that was birthed during that period of time was files that we needed to move back. All right? So we had to take the output of this command. So I, I took this command. I redirected that to like an input.txt file. So now I can go into input.txt, and now I can edit this document. And then what I did is I wrote a program that read in from this document. Now we have to parse that document. Now the problem with parsing this document <coughs> is it's not delimited in any sort of interesting way. So, for instance, we have spaces inside of that data. So we can't parse this on spaces, right? Um, so I had to go back out here and instead of using a... Um, and I know we're out of time here, but instead of using uh, going directly to there, instead I took stat and I piped it into another command called awk and told it to print uh, like dollar sign twelve or something like that, which is like the 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 twelfth thing. So I just had to keep uh, piping sends the output of one command into the input of another command. So I kept piping these things, the piping these things, the piping these things that got into a, a format that was kind of massageable. Then I wrote a Java program that read in from that file and wrote out a whole bunch of move commands. Move this file name to the downloads directory. All right, and then I had to rewrite that program for a couple different special cases. So in the end, those are the types of things that you can apply kind of IT programming type stuff to. Uh, and where command line actually becomes very powerful because this idea of taking the output of one thing, sending it to the input of another, isn't something we really think about with graphical user interfaces. So don't necessarily think about command line as being weak. All right, I will see everybody on Friday. We'll probably have a homework assignment then. Yeah.